All right, good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about the unified body of Christ. And before we get into this wonderful topic, I'm going to ask Elisa to pray for us. Okay, very good. <coughs> Dear Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us together this Sabbath to open your word and, and learn more about you and talk about the unity in, your, in the body of Christ, the unity in our church that's in you, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us and how we, we think about this topic and how we apply it, that we may represent you as your standard um, and, and, and be that witness of you within our body and to this community. We play, ask that you would bless this time that we have together to, to open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I know the topic of unity within a church and within the church body brings up a lot of different thoughts and a lot of different meanings. And I have to admit, I've spent many hours, <laughs> literally, trying to figure out what unity really looks like. Because we're all so different. We come from different backgrounds, different nationalities, and, and everything is so different, it's hard to figure out what that unity looks like. So as we go through <clears throat> the lesson today, hopefully, we'll start looking at what unity looks like as a body of Christ. So our memory text is, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. It's interesting that Paul uses the body <clears throat> to make a spiritual point, the human body. And we see that he uses this in, in his discussion around what the church should look like, because it's composed of various parts of differing abilities, all of which must work together for the body to be healthy. Paul continues the theme of unity. By so doing, he emphasizes that unity is an indispensable attribute or mark of the church. Unity is the result of God's <coughs> salvation but it is also God's tool for fulfilling his mission and for the church and through the church. For this reason, Paul moves beyond the theme of unity of the Jews and Gentiles in the, in the church to focus on the church's internal unity in life and mission. Now that in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, now that in Christ we are all brothers and sisters without respect to ethnicity. Paul discusses the unity of all Christians as members of the same body and involved in the same mission in Christ. Ephesians 1, 4, 1 through 16 talks about this, and I'm going to look at a few of these verses. We're going to start with um, verse 1, and we'll be looking at these scriptures again. You'll hear, some of, you'll hear many of these scriptures more than once today as we talk about this, this subject. So verse 1 says, Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And he says that we're to do it with loveliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another in love. So that's one of the keys to this unity, is, is this issue of being long-suffering and bearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> and in this world today, that bond of peace can be a challenge. So there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. We also see in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, if we jump down to verse 11, uh, we, we, we just, which we just read, 11 and 12, 
is the different gifts he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers. And he did this for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of faith. So the unity that God's looking for is our unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And in verse 14, it says, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men in the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking true in love, that we may grow up into him with Christ as the head. Now we see, too, that uh, in verse 16, he talks about edifying the body um, itself in love. So we see these same metaphors that Paul's using in Ephesians. We see this in Romans and 1 Corinthians. So again, in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And verse 4 says, For as many members in one body, all the members do not have the same functions. So even though we're together as one, we all perform different functions. And then it goes on to talk about <clears throat> uh, having then gifts differing according to the grace that God has given us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in uh, portion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it for our ministering, teaching, teaching, exhorting, exhorting. And so we see that whatever God, gift God gives us, he gives us to help us to get together and, and be part of the body. And so 1 Corinthians goes into the same thing about us being in one body in Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized, we see in verse 13, whether Jews, Greeks, or slaves. Uh, 14, verse 14 of Corinthians, it says, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And he goes on with different part, body parts saying, you know, the foot's not the hand and the eye is, is not the ear. And, and so if even though, like, the eye can't say I'm not part of the body, nor the hand can say I'm not part of the body, each one of these appendages has a different function but yet it all works together as one so we see this um, throughout corinthians so finally i just want to talk about here the unity of the church is achieved in several ways and i think we have a slide on this so first of all by sharing christ's attitudes of humility gentleness and patience to completing the ultimate model for the life of the church, Godhead, the three persons in one, the Father, Son, and, and uh, Spirit, their work in creation and redemption, by Christ's unifying tools for salvation that constitute the church, one hope, one faith, one baptism, and spiritual gifts through which God blesses the church to grow and unite in one body. So the church unity is essential to, the, to identifying life okay uh, all right is, is, i think i'm scott, sunday you're sunday scott's next yeah. <clears throat> okay today we're going to speak about the <coughs> unity of the spirit so i've decided to modernize our lesson and speak of the unity of all computers through the world wide web so i think if paul had <laughs> been around today he might be speaking about how the internet is so much more powerful than any individual computer. So, you know, we have all these devices here, phones, computers, and, um, you know, there's a large tech companies that have the mega servers, but nonetheless, none of them are as powerful as the internet as a whole. So likewise, as Christians, we're much more powerful when we work together and we connect with one another. And the Holy Spirit is the... Um, internet protocol, the, um, what is it called, the TCP, ICP, 
So the internet was officially invented on the 29th of October 1969, um, and then it became world uh, available for use by the public in April 30th, 1993. So there you go, some trivia about the internet for you. Um, and so we are to stay united with the Spirit. So now going to our lesson today, um, let's read Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. Um, walk in unity. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk um, worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of Christ. Let's see. So, oh, actually it goes all the way to 16, so I think I stopped at 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body is jointed and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, uh, causing the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. All right, so let's unpack this. Um, this this seems like quite a, a an amazing passage, kind of showing the unity of all of us in the Spirit of Christ. So, and I'm going to quote a little bit from the lesson study, which says that Paul begins the second half of Ephesians which is chapters 4 to 6, with a stirring call to unity, but in two major parts. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, he asks the believers to nurture the unity of the Spirit by exhibiting unity-building virtues, a call which supports a poetic list of seven ones. Second, in Ephesians 4, 7 to 16, Paul identifies the victorious, exalted Jesus as the source of grace in the people who lead in sharing the gospel and describes how they, together with all the church members, contribute to the health, growth, and unity of the body of Christ. Um, so I wanted to talk about how we can all achieve unity. And it seems like one of the key traits uh, comes from this Ephesians 4.2. And now I'm going to quote the Ephesians 4.2 from the NIV because I think it, it uses some words that are easier to understand for some of our um, listeners who may not uh, be as familiar with the King James verbiage. So it says, but be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So Paul explains this humility as counting others as more significant than yourselves. And that's in, if he, in Philippians 2.3. Humility, then, may be understood not as a negative virtue of self-deprecation, but as a positive one of appreciating and serving others. And that's from our Sabbath school lesson. 
And then I wanted to quote Ephesians 5.27, which we've referred to before in the past. But uh, it, this kind of gives you the purpose of why we need to be unified in the, in the Spirit. And that is, uh, Ephesians 5.27 says that he might present her, that is the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So without taking Paul's advice, we'll never be able to achieve this unity. Um, and th this is kind of the how-to. So by, by walking in humbleness and developing those attributes um, given to us by, uh, not just by Paul, but also by the pen of inspiration. Um, and so I wanted to also look at some quotes from um, Ellen White. Uh, so this is advice to church leaders from the pen of inspiration. Kindness, courtesy, and the lowliness of Christ. So um, she says, you need kindness, courtesy, meekness, and lowliness of Christ. You may have valuable qualifications that can be perfected for the highest service if sanctified to God. You should feel the necessity of approaching your brethren with kindness and courtesy, uh, not with harshness and severity. You do not realize the harm you do by sharp, domineering spirit toward them. The ministers in your conference become disheartened, losing courage they might have if you, give, if you would have given them the respect, kindness, and confidence and love. By your manner of dealing, you have separated the hearts of your brethren from you so that your counsel has not had much influence over them for good. This is not as the Lord would have it. He is not pleased with your attitude towards your brethren. So I think what this is saying is that we need to cultivate kindness, courtesy, and, and a lowliness, uh, that is humility. Uh, and then there's another quote that I liked from the Spirit of Prophecy, which says, It was by cherishing a humble, teachable spirit that these men gained experience um, that enabled them to go out as workers into the harvest field. Their example presents to Christians a lesson of great value. There are many who make but little progress in the divine life because they are too self-sufficient to occupy, occupy the position of learners. They are con um, content with a superficial knowledge of God's word and they do not wish to change their faith or practice and hence make no effort to obtain greater light. So, in, in closing, I guess the way we achieve unity is by treating others well and as more important than ourselves. Uh, so we'll end with that. Okay. Lisa. Okay. All right. So Barb talked about seven components to our unity or our oneness. She mentioned them in her, her beginning here. Um, and, but it, they really encompass the relationship we have with each other and with Christ and with the Father. So uh, looking at Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 again, you see those seven components. There's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God of all. Those are your seven. So let's take a look at each one of these and just see, dig a little bit deeper and see what the Bible says about them. So starting with the body, which is the church. Looking at Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, we read, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we get the picture here that, you know, all of these roles that are being played by different individuals that were appointed by Christ to edify the church, it is really for the growth and the maturity of his body, which is the church, right? And then in Ephesians 1, to 23, we read, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So it's completely spelled out there so we not, need not be confused of what this is. It says the church, which is his body. And then in Romans 12, 5, we read, 
So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So, you know, one of the things as I was studying the lesson this week and, and thinking about this, this unity that, that is being discussed about this body of Christ, how we are all many members with different roles, but one in spirit and purpose, um, it really is a reflection of the Godhead. So the Godhead has three distinct persons, but they are one in purpose and they are one in, in, in spirit, and they have different roles. And so we are really a reflection of the Godhead when we are operating in unity as God has uh, set the standard for. And so it's, it's something to think about because that's what we should aspire towards. Um, and then so going back to the second component, looking at spirit, in Matthew 10, 20, we read, for it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So not just any spirit, but it's the spirit of your Father. Um, so that is God's spirit. And then the third item, the third component, is the hope of your calling. We read in 1 Thessalonians 2.12 that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So this is that hope of his calling. He's calling you into his kingdom and glory. And then in Romans 5, 2, it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So the, again, he's calling us into the hope of, of his glory. Um, and then looking at... The component number four, which is Lord, the one Lord, we read in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So the Bible clearly identifies who our Lord is, our one Lord is the one Lord Jesus Christ. And then component number five, faith. If we read Colossians 1.23, it reads, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So our faith is to be solid, grounded, and steadfast, and anchored on the hope of the gospel. Um, and so that is the scriptures, as portrayed in the scriptures, the gospel of Christ. Component number, well, before we go to component six, let's read one more on faith, Colossians 2, 7. And it says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. So again, it's point is, pointing us to the faith of the gospel as... Um, as described and, and represented in, in the Holy Scriptures. Then in component number six, one baptism, we read in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So that baptism is in Christ. Uh, you may recall in the New Testament, that in when we, the early passages of Ephesians we studied when Paul first came to Ephesus, there were believers that were of John's baptism. And when he came to them and asked, well, whose baptism? And they said, John. He says, well, you know, you need to be baptized into Christ. So in, in providing that full gospel, uh, picture to them, they then became baptized in Christ into that full understanding of Christ. And so it's that one baptism that we are to be baptized in. And then the last component, one father. And this is, uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 8, 6, which reads, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. So one God and, and Father 
who is the um, God, God and Father that, he, that the Lord Jesus Christ um, also served when, when he walked on earth. And then in Job eleven seven to 9, we read, Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. So God the Father is so much larger and, 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 and bigger and, you know, more comprehensive a being than we can even <coughs> begin to fathom or understand. And, and this is the God who we serve. <clears throat> so note that Paul is pointing out two main ideas here about the unity of God's church. First of all, unity is a spiritual fact. It's rooted in these seven components. And it's a reality to be celebrated. And then number two, this unity requires our zeal to nurture and grow it. It's not something we learn once and then put on a shelf and forget. It's something that we experience and we, we live and we mature into through the working of the Holy Spirit. So whatever our failings as a body of Christ, we should rejoice in the work of God in Christ in unifying the church. Rejoice in the theology or theological reality of the unity of the Spirit. Believing and rejoicing in this amazing promise of the oneness in Christ will empower us to return to the at times difficult work of advancing this unity with fresh conviction. That is, in doing so that we accomplish God's own work. The unity of the church is essential to Paul's doctrine of the church. However, Paul does not model this unity after some human institution. Instead, Paul roots the unity of the church in the very nature of the one true God, the triune God identified in this passage in Ephesians 4. God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead are at work in the plan of salvation and in creating and building the church into one body in Christ in the fullness of the Father. So I'll go ahead and pass back to you, Barbara. Okay, we're going to talk about the exalted Christ, the giver of gifts. And we're going to start looking at, uh, with Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. And we're going to look at this generosity <clears throat> that Christ uh, gives to his believers. Verse 7 says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts to men. So this, this whole concept of captivity, taking captivity captive is, is quite interesting. He ascended. What does that mean? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So Christ came as one of us, a captive to sin here on this earth, yet he conquered it, went to the grave, and arose. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So Psalms 68:18 reads similarly. And we see from David, you have ascended on high, you have led the captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious the Lord God, that the Lord God might dwell here. So we see uh, him as a conquering general who, having conquered his enemies, ascended on the hill on which his capital city is built with the captives of the battle in his train. Psalms 1 and 2 says, Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As the smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish from his presence. So then, <clears throat> he then receives tribute or gifts from his conquered foes, noting that Paul adjusts this imagery to the exalted Christ giving gifts based on the wider context of the psalm. If we follow the order of the psalm, <clears throat> the ascent, Christ's ascension to heaven, in Ephesians 21 through 23, occurs first, followed by the descent 
which is risen, exalted Jesus, give gifts, and fulfills all things. So Ephesians 1, uh, 21 through 23 says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but that also which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, which is the body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. This is Paul's way of depicting the Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. And I want to talk, I want us to look at this um, outpouring of the Spirit in Acts 2. We're going to take a couple minutes there and go uh, and take a look at this. So we know that it, uh, in verse 1, that this happened on the day of Pentecost. When it had fully come, they are of one accord in one place. And if we look back in, in um, Acts 1, they were in the upper room, they were praying, they were talking about Christ, they had forgiven one another, they were no longer fighting over who's going to be the greatest. They had taken on a whole new purpose in their lives and, and an understanding as they were praying there. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in our own language, which we were born? I'm gonna, that was verse 8. I'm going to jump down now to 15. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it was the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so we see this being fulfilled. And this is, the prophet, Joel's prophecies is, is still being fulfilled today. And it says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, because we're living in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And my Manservants and maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. What was interesting about that upper room? I'll do a little quiz. Do any of you remember how many were in the upper room? 11? 120. Yeah, I was going to say it was over 100. Yeah. But it wasn't just uh, the mother of Jesus were mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. There were women there. They were men there. Mm -hmm. They were all given the Holy Spirit, every last one of them. So they were all able to, to go out and uh, pour out God to the community. We see that, we, we see Peter's sermons, but all of them were able to, to go out and, and preach and teach. Mm -hmm. So I will show wonders in heaven and above and signs on the earth beneath, blood, va uh, fire, uh, vapor, and smoke, the sun, shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. So we see all of these things coming and happening in our time. But the point is God gave us his gift through the Spirit. Mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're baptized, we're baptized with water and the Spirit, aren't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. And with fire. Mm -hmm. So we're given that, we're, we're all given uh, an abundance of gifts that we can use to uh, further God's work. And so I just want to jump down to Acts 47, or 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were to be saved. And so God had given them all these gifts and gives us gifts for the purpose of saving 
And so he did that through giving us, as we saw in, as we've read in Ephesians, by giving us a, a gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and equipping all of the saints for the work of ministry. And if, as you read the gifts of the Spirit, there are more than just these that we're studying today. And we'll get into that in a later class. But I want to finish <coughs> uh, with Ellen White here. It says, Ye shall receive power, page 158. Christ ascended on high, leading captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. When after Christ's ascension, the Spirit came down as promised, like a rush, rushing mighty wind, filling the whole place where the disciples were assembled, that what was that effect? Thousands were converted daily. And so we need to be praying for that kind of spirit in our lives and in our church as well. Okay. All right. Scott, so I guess you can I'd, follow that. Wednesday's lesson um, sort of builds on Tuesday's lesson. And so we may be repeating some of the same things, but um, I think they bear repeating because they were important. So I, I picture that in ancient times, a conquering king, when he would come uh, from his battle of conquest, he would give gifts to the people who helped him out in this war. So in this case, I think this kind of gives the setting for how important these gifts are which Christ is giving to the church, how important they are. Um, and Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, he says, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints and for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to a unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the fullness of of Christ. So, and I'm going to skip over Psalm 68, 18, because I feel like Barbara did a good job of covering it and about leading the captivity captive. Just one quick comment on that is that, um, to me, it seems like it's one of these interesting sort of oxymorons, like killing death means eternal life, or enslaving slavery means having freedom. So Christ is, or, or Paul is using in this case, this sort of um, interesting uh, wording that uh, it makes you think a little bit, so it gives you a little bit uh, more knowledge. So uh, now let's talk a little bit about the, um, the gifts themselves to some apostles. So apostles were sort of church administrators or assistants to Christ, and then he talks about prophets, <coughs> those who proclaim the word of God, who declare the end from the beginning, um, evangelists, those who are fulfilling the great commissions of preaching the gospel to all parts of the world, and then shepherds and teachers. And interestingly, I think it's pointed out in the lesson that um, the word shepherds and teachers was not two categories, but meaning that this was the same, same group. Um, so, and then just as Jethro uh, advised Moses to have leaders of smaller groups of 1,110. So Christ has set up the church to have leaders that nurture uh, on, on smaller and individual levels. Um, so it says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the work, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Um, so the... Oh, and, I wanted to also point out another part here that was an interesting thing in the lesson, which is that the early Adventists um, especially um, talked about the gift of prophecy continuing on till the end of time. So there's a story about um, a captain of a ship who was bound to follow the instructions uh, that, were, uh, that he was given. And one of the instructions said that when he gets close to a particular port, uh, a pilot would come on board to help him guide the vessel. So this pilot was represented as, as being um, the spirit of prophecy. So likewise, as we are coming close to, um, 
getting to port, which would be the promised land, the heavenly promised land, the New Jerusalem, that we need this uh, additional guide, which is the spirit of prophecy to help us. Uh, and then he gives an interesting quote here in the, in the Sabbath school lessons. Who now heed the original book of directions, those who reject the pilot or those who receive him, as the book instructs them? Judge ye, says Uriah Smith. Do we discard the Bible by the endorsing of visions? So Uriah Smith makes a good point here, and this was the review and herald from January 13th, 1863 meaning that the Bible itself tells us we're going to have a pilot to help us guide us more safely, and that pilot is the spirit of prophecy. Um, So um, then I wanted to also focus on some some other aspects of um, Christian leadership, since I think this all of these positions that they're talked about, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, basically I think you could sum sum it up as saying the church leadership. So um, in the book Prophets and Kings, um, Ellen White says, the path of men who are placed as leaders is not an easy one, but they are to see in every difficulty a call to prayer. Never are they to fail of consulting the great source of all wisdom. Strengthened and enlightened by the master worker, they will be enabled to stand firm against the unholy influences and to discern right from wrong, good from evil. They will approve that which God approves and will strive earnestly against the introduction of wrong principles in his cause. So I guess this highlights the importance of... um, as, as church leaders, um, we have to follow the, the master worker, and, and the only way we'll be able to do that is by prayer. Um, and then um, the, the gift of prophecy is to continue all the way to the end. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll indulge in rereading the Joel 2, 27 and 28. Uh, because I think it's worth repeating. Um, Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Um, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Uh, Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So, this, um, so this is an Old Testament quote, then there was the New Testament quote from Ephesians, and they're both basically saying uh, the same thing, which is that um, if we are to um, follow God all the way into the port of the promised land, that we need to, we need to um, have all these gifts of the Spirit. And then um, I'll, I'll end with talking about a quote from uh, Christ Object Lesson. This one says, Learning, talents, eloquence, may, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed, but without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched, no sinner uh, one to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. So let's plug in to the world wide web of the Holy Spirit, the the universe wide web of the Holy Spirit who will enable us to do that which to fulfill our mission. (laughs) Thank you. I love that analogy. Yeah. Thank Thank you. you. All right. So growing up into Christ, um, so Paul well understood the dangers that faced the Ephesian church, who was made up of, of, of people who were mostly um, Gentiles, once pagan, and without Christ, without hope. But they were now in Christ Jesus, and they had been grafted into the body of God's true church. So although they still lived in a world where the prevailing culture threatened to discredit 
their beliefs. God was faithful in giving the gifts of apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, and teaching to strengthen and establish the church in sound doctrine. In Ephesians 4:14, 4, Paul warns the believers of these dangers. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Um, so Paul first expresses those, the Christians as not to remain as children who are immature in their beliefs. These will be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. In other words, someone who is weak in their belief without solid footing in the truth, which is in, in God's holy scriptures. We sometimes refer to that type of person as wishy-washy or indecisive. Without growth into sound doctrine, we are in danger of being deceived by false teachings. You know, that's as, as, as important as it was in Paul's day, it's still important today, right? Probably more important. Yeah. Paul explicitly states that there will be false doctrines and divisions that threaten to distract the, and deceive the believers from the truth, and that people will deliberately intend to deceive and cause the believers to fall away from the truth. Paul uses the Greek word for dice playing here to describe the trickery that's in play. So we should not be surprised by these tactics, whether they come from within or without the church. The devil uses these tactics to divide and destroy God's church. First Peter 5.8 says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Paul believed that this decisive divisiveness was an important mark of error for the, for the church. That which nourishes and grows the body and helps it hold together is good, while that which depletes and divides it is evil. By turning from divisive teaching to that of tested and trusted teachers who proclaim sound doctrine, the believers will advance toward true Christian maturity and play effective roles in the body of Christ. So Paul counsels the church to grow up in Christ. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, we read, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by that what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Paul advocates for the unity of the church and expounds on the need to actively foster unity in the body. While unity is a theological reality, as we discussed in Monday's lesson, like every cherished relationship, it does require hard and consistent work on our part, striving together with God for unity. Each of us is a part of the body and should contribute to its health and its growth. The church today, as we discuss, faces the same dangers from false doctrines and false teachers, secular societal norms that push against the truth to tear down the hallmarks that were established by Christ. How can we escape these dangers? Well, the Bible counsels us to be established in Bible truth and to test all teachings against that truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In Ephesians 5, 26, we read, That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And in Psalms 119, 105, we read, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And then lastly, in Isaiah 8, 20, we read, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So as members of the body of Christ, we have a unifying function to help each other grow up together in Christ, established on the sure foundation of God's holy word. Pass to you, Barb, to close for the evening. All right. We have, I have a few final thoughts. I just 
wanted to make a comment on, on your lesson, Elisa. Mm -hmm. There is so much untruth out there in the world today. That's right. And there is so much division. We see it every day in our, our everyday walks in life. We see it in, in the different churches. We see it in politics. We see it everywhere. So truthful, truly, the only truth out there is the word of God. And so yeah. Paul was absolutely spot on. Absolutely that. right. And, and, you know, the Bible tells us, I think it's in Proverbs, there's a time to be silent, there's a time to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, and now more than ever in our culture, as so much is thrown at us and it's pushed at us to things that are not true to the Bible, that we have to embrace them according to society, it, it's, it's time to speak on some of those things, I think. Well, and it seems like the, the longer we go on, the further people diverge away from the Word of God. Yeah, and I think it's also ironic that under freedom of speech, uh, you're allowed, or, you know, the separation of church and state, you're allowed to teach any religion in school except for talking about Christ. So you're not allowed to talk about Christ, but you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about shamanism. Any, any religion's okay as long as it's not Christ. Well, even people who say they're, they belong to Christ, um, you have to test their spirits as well. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, they, sometimes they are and, and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they aren't. <laughs> well, and, and we know that... Go ahead. Uh, there was going to be a counterfeit Christ. So my guess is that the teachings of the counterfeit Christ are already here mm, because... Yeah. I think Lucifer, in order to make his impersonation successful, he has to tell people what they want to hear. So he, he prepares the people by putting in the doctrines that are already agreeing with his mode of thinking rather than God's mode of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So our, the fin my final thoughts today, thank you both very much. The fi my final thoughts today are from Our Higher Calling, page 182 where she says, the members of the Church of God on this earth are as the different parts of a machine, all closely related to one another, and all closely related and dependent on the one great creator, the one great center. There is to be unity in diversity. No member of the Lord's firm can work successfully in independence detached from the others. All are to use their entrusted capabilities in his service, that each may minister to the perfection of the whole. Let me just give you mine. My, um, my battery's dead. Sorry. Sorry about that, my battery died real quick. So, um, so each of us are to work under the supervision of God, but Christ's wonderful union of divinity with humanity, we are assured that even in this world, we may be partakers of the divine nature. Christ has pledged himself to cooperate with those to whom he has entrusted talents. He has pledged himself to train us to be his co-laborers. He will help us to follow his example, doing good, refusing to do evil. We are to be consecrated channels through whom the love of Christ flows to those who are in need of help. So we have a mission on this earth when we become uh, co-workers with Christ. And he will give us and will equip us. We just need to follow through and do the work. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this lesson that we have had on unity in you. Lord, we pray that the unity that we have in you, we will use our gifts, the gifts that you have given us so liberally for saving souls, for bringing people to you. 
You gave us a mission to go and preach the gospel and baptize, Lord. And you've also given us the three angels' message to warn people that the time on this earth is almost at an end and that decisions will have to be made, decisions for their souls and decisions for eternal life. So, Lord, we just pray that we will be faithful to you, that we will follow your will, and that we will remain in unity in you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.